Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhills.church to watch or listen to past messages. We hope that you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Hey, one more time, why don't we thank Michael and the team for what they brought this morning. They did a great job. It's an exciting day because today is Picnic Sunday. We've had Picnic Sunday for the last, I believe, 13 years of the church's history. Are you excited about going to the picnic? Some of you excited about going to the picnic? I am excited. There's going to be food and friends and fellowship and football and food <laughs> and a lot of other stuff. And we are going to have a great time. If you're newer to the church or you've never been to our annual picnic, you've got to come. Uh, it's, it really is a lot of fun. It's right over at Mountain Edge uh, Regional Park. And uh, you should, inside your church program, have uh, directions on how to get there. If you're still not sure, you're not sure how to get there, you can go by the Connect desk on the way out, and they'll give you directions uh, directly over there. Man, it's good to see everybody today. How was your week? Man, I got to tell you this. I have been praying for this church over these last two weeks, probably more than I've ever have, and I'm thankful to see you here. I'm thankful that you're ready to study the Word of God. If you're ready to study the Word of God today, would you say Amen. We've got a brand new sermon series we begin today entitled Symbols of Hope. One glance and you'll remember. Hope is a luxury in the world that we live in. A luxury that is readily available but rarely acquired. Natural disasters, human cruelty, Systemic prejudice, extreme poverty seem to drag the human spirit into pain and to sorrow. But somehow, the followers of Christ demonstrate an abundance of hope in the face of tragic circumstances. Symbols of Hope is a six-week series that will explain this phenomena in light of six ancient symbols that we as Christians hold dear. At each and every one of these symbols, it's designed that one glance at the symbol and you'll remember hope that we have in Christ. These are the six symbols, as you see here, that we'll be going over over the next six weeks. The first is the rainbow. That's today's sermon. The second is called the Cairo Alpha Omega, maybe a little bit less familiar to some of us. That's next Sunday. And I tell you this. Because it's unfamiliar to you, you will be blown away by its significance. I think that's a symbol of Christianity we need to bring back. The next one after that is called the Trinity Knot. It symbolizes, for those who may be quick on your feet, the Trinity of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The, the symbol after that that we'll be looking at is the fish. The ancient symbol of secrecy between brother of Christ and brother of Christ. Back when there was persecution and no one knew who was a Christian because if you knew, they would be thrown into jail. There was a symbol that was shared between Christians. And we're going to look at the fish. The next one is well familiar to every Christian who's ever lived, and that is the cross itself, followed by the dove that represents the, the Holy Spirit of God. I cannot wait to explain to you these significant symbols. And symbols themselves have been designed, especially during the days of, lar uh, of large amounts of um, illiteracy, that a Christian can see this symbol and understand the hope that they have in Christ. Today we begin with the symbol of the rainbow. Genesis chapter number 9, verses 6 through 15. This is not the only time we see the rainbow found in the Word of God, but this is the main reference. The Bible tells us in chapter 9, verses 6... Through 15, it says this, if you're following along, whosoever sheds man's blood by him, by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Verse 8, and God spoke unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds and the cattle and the every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Skip down to verse 13. 
I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all the earth, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Let us pray. Father in heaven, my prayer this morning is that you would help us to grasp the significance of the rainbow and the beautiful hope that it brings to every soul on this planet and especially every soul that follows you this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. When I was 18 years old, I went to college uh, in Florida. Now, this was a strange thing for someone who was born and raised in Las Vegas to move to Florida. One of the most significant differences was that they had what's called humidity. How many of you are familiar with humidity? Some of you have never left Las Vegas, but you've read about humidity. <laughs> humidity, I was born and raised here. Again, I, I don't understand the concept unless I experienced it. And humidity is water in the air. There's like vapors of water, and when you breathe, you don't feel, you know, dry cactus in your throat. You feel moisture and water in the air. One of the things that was unfamiliar as well was um, something called rain. It fell, for, it was water that falls from the sky, and it makes you wet, and it, and it also helps plants grow. That's why we have no plants here. So when I moved from Las Vegas, the desert, to a place like Pensacola, Florida, this was a unique thing. Another thing that I experienced was hurricanes. In fact, when I arrived in Pensacola, I arrived a little early, and the dorm that I was planning on moving into was not prepared. Now, I look back and I try to remember why exactly at the age of 18 I had gone so early to move to Florida before the dorms opened up, but I don't remember why. I think it had to do with something uh, like a job, but I remember getting there early and I had no place to stay, but my friends had, some, or my parents had some friends who lived next to the college, and they lived in a, a trailer park, and uh, I remember moving in there. I was going to stay there just a few days right before I moved into the school, and just so happened that I moved into that trailer park during Hurricane Earl of 1998. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to go through a hurricane, a trailer park is not the place I want to be. <laughs> I remember it was early in the morning. They went off to work, and they knew that a storm was coming, but they said, it's just a tropical storm. Don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. First of all, just water falling from the sky scared me to death. Secondly, the water was not falling as they left. I remember they left to work, and I was staying in the, and I remember going outside and seeing the water, and the rain is beautiful, and the wind started blowing, but I noticed that the water was not falling like this. It was falling like this. How many of you have ever been through a, a hurricane, and you see the water, and it's not falling? It seems to be flowing up and around and scared me to death. I went inside. I shut the door. I turned on the TV. The newscast lady was there, you know. I love how they always do it. They've got the gear on, and they're standing in front of the ocean, and they're blowing, you know, like this. And, and I'm watching, and it freaked me out. And what, what scared me the most is when the power went out. Now, this was the days before cell phones, and some of you are thinking in 1998, I had a cell phone, but understand, I was an 18-year-old. I had no cell phone. In 1998, there was no power in, the, in this little trailer. There was no cell phone, and all of a sudden, I sat through that storm all day long as that trailer rocked back and forth. How many of you know this? Josh became a man of prayer in that moment. <laughs> this is not an exaggeration or story. I'll tell you more about it someday because there's a lot that took place. But I will tell you this. I was scared to death, uh, fearful for my life. One of my favorite poets speaks of the fact that in every life, some rain must fall. Some difficulties must happen. But you know, one of the things that we have as a promise from God is that every time the rain does fall, afterward, a bow will signify God's love. It's a universal gift from God, this symbol. The symbol of the rainbow symbolizes to us the promises of God. How many of you in this room today are thankful for the promises of God? Would you say amen? amen? 
See, the rainbow itself symbolizes the promises of God, and there are many that we could speak of, but for today's purposes, we're only going to touch on three. Three promises that we see in the rainbow. And these are not promises that you only see when you see in Scripture. They are promises that every time you look into the sky and see a rainbow, and again, for those who are from Las Vegas and has never left, a rainbow is something that comes in the clouds after it rains. When you see the rainbow, it signifies to us that God is a God who keeps his promises and a God who loves his creation. Let's go in and see those promises as are outlined in the story of Genesis chapter 9. The first one that I want you to see today, the first promise that we recognize from the symbol of the rainbow is this. Number one, that God will judge the wicked. Promise number one found in this story is that God will judge the wicked. Look at what it says in chapter 9 and verse 6. It says, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For the image of God, he made man. Why is this in the story, in the midst of the story of, of, the, uh, of, of Noah and the flood and the animals and all of this? Why is this here? The reason why is because the Bible describes the days of Noah as extremely violent and terribly wicked. So bad was the world during Noah's age that God told Noah, I'm sending the flood to destroy man's wickedness. I'm saving you and your family alone on the ark. Gather all the animals together. I'm going to flood the world, and you alone are going to restart what we see as humanity. Why did God do this? Because the world was such a violent, wicked place that God could no longer allow that wickedness and he had to judge that wickedness. God judges wickedness. Now, before we get on our high horse, how many of you agree that at some point in our lives we've all sinned, which makes us wicked? How many of you would, would agree with me that we are all sinners? Would you say amen or raise your hand? All right, some of you know this. Some of you just haven't lived long enough to realize your sin is sin too, amen? We're all sinners. Now, normally at this point in a sermon, when I say we're all sinners, I would give some example of some sin that I commit. But I got to tell you, today I'm not going to do that. Why? Because I'm going to talk to you about the sin of another. They're in this room. Some of you get nervous because you've done counseling with me. I'm not going to throw you under the bus unless your name is Fred Murray. Fred. Fred and I, as many of you know, work together here. He's one of the great pastors that lead the church here. And Fred and I have been buddies since we were four, five, six years old. And I remember one time I stole M&Ms. Many people tease me about that. But I'll tell you, let me tell you about something Fred did. And it wasn't when he was in a, as a child. It was church picnic Sunday. And back in church picnic Sunday, many, many years ago, we had different events. Now, church picnic today, we have a lot of events that have, that have grown to be a custom. For example, the face painting booth. For example, the pie eating contest. There's going to be a pie eating contest. Today. A pie eating contest today. There's all sorts of great food and bounce houses and stuff for the kids and a football game for a lot of guys and stuff. It's going to be a great day. But back in the day, one of the things we used to do was a chili cook-off where people would... How many of you have been around long enough to remember the chili cook-off? Some of you are. We had a chili cook-off. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something you've never heard. This is great. I'm excited. We had a chili cook-off every year. And man, people get serious about it. They get their chili recipes from grandma. They get their chili recipes from Aunt Susie in Alabama. They get their chili recipes online. They'd find chili recipes everywhere. And they'd bring in their best chili recipes. And then you would have a couple people that would go and taste it and decide which was the best chili. Well, I got to tell you what Fred did. Fred was so concerned because Fred is always concerned about how things are going at the church. So it makes him a great pastor. He was so concerned that, so, that there would not be enough chili, he decided to make some himself. And the way he decided to make it was to go to Albertsons <laughs> and buy about 10 cans of Hormel chili, open those cans, put it in a crock pot, and bring it. Well, somebody took that, that chili and they put it on the line with all of the other chilies. How many of you want to guess who won the chili cook-off that day? <laughs> I don't remember how it went down, but I, in my mind, I can remember Frank coming to me like, what do I do? Keep your mouth shut, you know? 
Like, yay, Fred! Fred's great! It's Hormel. Some of you that were there, you lost. You're mad. You're never coming back. I know. <laughs> See, we all, we all make mistakes. We all sin. But you need to understand something about Noah's day. Noah's day, the Bible describes it as such a violent and wicked culture, such a violent and wicked place that God sent wrathful judgment to destroy mankind. This, this, this in essence was no, no joking matter. You say, well, I thought God was a God of love. Yes, God is a God of love. And because God is a God of love, God is also a God of justice. Please hear that and hear it deeply. Because God is a God of love, he is a God of justice. Imagine with me a single mother. She works hard to raise her children. She works hard to provide them food. She works hard day and night. No one is there to help her with homework. No one is there to help her feed her children. No one is there to help her do all the things that a mother and father could do together. Imagine this single mother. She's been saving for weeks because there's a movie coming out that her kids want to see. And she plans it all ahead. It's like a month and ahead, and she's been saving, nickel and diming, to take them to McDonald's and to a movie. She's ready to go. She's got her pockets full of pennies, man. She's ready. And the day before this happens, she notices her check engine light. She thinks, man, I got to take it to the mechanic. So she does. The mechanic pulls it in. She knows nothing about cars and trusts implicitly whatever the mechanic says. Mechanic pulls it in, notices the check engine light, runs a diagnostic test, and discovers that really all she needs is a new air filter. But, she, but he writes it up as a timing belt replacement and charges her $600. That's wicked. Wicked. And justice needs to come down upon that man in his business. So who's going to do it? She doesn't know any better. What, the Better Business Bureau are going to catch it? Who is going to bring justice to that single mother? Who? God is. The rainbow tells us. Imagine with me an anxious groom... He's been looking forward to this wedding for months. Then in that moment that he's finally married, they have a beautiful two-week honeymoon together and several months of marriage, he, he, he just enjoys every moment. After several months of marriage, he decides to surprise his wife with flowers and come home from work early and walks in the door with flowers behind his back and finds his new bride in bed with another man. And as the flowers drop to the floor... And his heart drops to the ground. Who will bring justice to that man? Oh, he could throw a fit and he can go to divorce court. But who will bring justice to this man? You see, the reason God is a God of justice is because he's a God of love. Imagine with me an innocent child. Mom and dad are gone on a date night and the new babysitter seems perfectly nice. But a few minutes after bedtime, the babysitter comes into the bedroom with a game to play. And in a moment, the babysitter strips innocence away from the child. And that happens again and again and again. And my question is, for that child who is in fear and in guilt, who will bring justice to that little child? Imagine with me a man who has more money to, than he knows what to do with, so he begins to stockpile guns and brings them to a casino floor and begins to unload his wrath and anger and malice on an unknowing, innocent crowd. My question is, who brings, in, who brings justice? Who? Who? I declare this. The rain, rainbow reminds us and symbolizes this, that God is a God of justice, and because he is a God of love, he will justify, and he will bring justice, and he will bring judgment upon the wicked. When I see the rainbow, I think this, God's promise is that he will judge the wicked. 
One of the things that make God so good is that he will refuse to overlook injustice, thievery, betrayal, abuse, violence. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, some of you might be sitting back thinking and getting ahead of me a little bit, and you think, wait a second, Pastor Josh. If God is a God of justice, and the soul that sins, it will die. What about me? Because I, I said I was one of the sinners. Well, if you're one of the sinners, the Bible says you deserve to die for your sin. The wages of sin is death. The payment for your sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So one of the beautiful things that we see in the life of Noah is that Noah was not a perfect man. In fact, over and over in his story, there are mistakes he makes and sins he commits. What made Noah different than everyone else is simply this. God, by his grace, selected Noah and brought him to truth. And by faith, Noah believed God's promises and entered into his safety, the ark, and was saved because of God's grace through Noah's faith. You say, Pastor Josh, I'm wicked too. Don't I deserve God's judgment? Yes, you do. But by God's grace, he has revealed himself to you. And if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you can believe on him, enter the ark that is Jesus Christ, and be born again and saved even today. Friend, God is a God of justice, but as a God of love, he wants to offer you mercy and forgiveness. And the only way you receive that is through the death of Jesus upon the cross. He was buried and rose from the grave for each and every one of you. And if you put your faith in Jesus today, he'll save your soul. Have you been born again? Have you been saved? If you've never been saved, why don't you call upon Christ and be your savior? Today you'll be saved. But one of the beautiful things that I love about the rainbow is it tells me this. It reminds me of the promise of God. And that is this. God will not let sin go unpunished. He will judge the wicked. Here's the second promise that I see in the rainbow. The second one we see in the story as well. He will reward the weary. He will judge the wicked, but he will reward the weary. How many of you are tired today? How many of you are just like, I'm so tired. I love what I talked about. I say, how you doing? Fine. How you really doing? I'm tired. I'm so tired. I'm tired. You want to be tired? Think about these people that, that were on the ark. Poor Noah. Noah and his family were on the ark for quite some time. And, and they weren't just on a boat. I mean, they were on this boat with all these animals. Think about being Shem. And you got elephant poo duty. <laughs> oh, pastor. Oh, I mean, you try putting an elephant on a boat for a year. Cleaning up after it. How many of you think after the first couple of weeks, this was not, you know, this was not Royal Caribbean. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> this, was not, this was not a Disney cruise. These people were working like dogs, no pun intended, because the dogs were in there too. See, the answer is this. These people were exhausted and weary, but you know what I love about this story? We see that God brings hope to them, even in the midst of their exhaustion. Look, look at what it says as the story continues. It says, and as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth, verse 7, if you're, not, if you're following along. As for you, Noah and his family, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. You know what he's saying? He's saying, yes, I have judged the sin of the world. And by my grace, through your faith, I have saved you. But now I've got a blessing for you. Now listen to me, those who have been saved and are in Christ. God has a reward for those who he has saved. Even in the midst of the terrible tragedy like this. I remember when Heather was nine months pregnant with Jonathan. To be specific, eight months and two weeks. Man, and we were so excited about Jonathan coming. We didn't know when it was going to happen, but we had seen from television everywhere that the water would break and that I would go crazy. That's all I know, because that's what television taught me. The water will break. I'll go crazy. I'm allowed to speed, right? <laughs> we know that from television. And we get to the hospital, and the baby's coming. And it was the middle of the night. We had a little apartment that we lived in off on Alexander Road in the north part of town. And there in the middle of the night, I don't know, probably 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, Heather would know specifically, Heather's water broke. She, to this day, will tell you she heard a pop. I don't know that that's true. 
but I'm not going to question her. <laughs> she said the water broke, and all of a sudden she woke up. And you say, well, what happened, Pastor Josh? I want to hear the story. Did you grab your, your coat and your hat, and you're running around finding all the different ways to get the hospital? Not really. Like, I wish it was that way because it would make a great Sturman story, you know? But it wasn't. You say, did you freak out? No, not really. The water broke. We were ready for it. Water broke. She woke me up, and we got all excited, start smiling at each other. Went around the corner, got dressed, grabbed a little bag, went to the hospital. I did speed. <laughs> because I always do. This is what we learned previously about the water breaking. We knew that the water breaking was necessary as a precursor to the coming blessing. We got out of bed, hurried to the hospital so we could meet Jonathan. See, life tells us this, right? To get to the blessing, you have to go through the breaking of the water, through the suffering of labor through the pain, then you arrive at the blessing. One of the things we know as a promise from God from his rainbow is that he rewards those who come through. Maybe you've been through a tragic event and you're weary. The storm came, the water broke. You came down with an illness or your relationship didn't work out or the business that you are part of let you go or the company that you trusted turned their back on you. Please hear this, please hear this. The water breaking is a sign of hope for you because, because you're going through that, it is significant that God is bringing you through that tragedy to bring you into his blessing. See, what you have to do is you have to get beyond the storm and look up to the sky and see the rainbow. You can't get to the rainbow until you go through the storm. Genesis chapter 9, verse 8 talks about this. And God spoke to Noah and said unto his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you. Why does Noah and the sons of Noah get a covenant with God himself? Here, here's why. Because they went through the storm. I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants forever after you. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Never again will you see this. This rainbow signifies this. And God said, this is a sign and a covenant that I'll make between me and you. I will set my rainbow in the cloud. See, what I love about this is you must understand the historical significance of this moment. Man was in a better position at this point in history than he had ever been before. Because at this point, God was starting over with man and a personal relationship, not only with, 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 with Noah, but with his wife, with his three sons, with their three wives, and the descendants after them. We see that man was in a better position than ever, and the rainbow was a sign of better times to come. Get this. The rainbow being a, better, a sign of better times to come is exactly what you've got to grasp, hold on to in the midst of your sorrow and tragedy that you're coming out of. Look at what happened in Vegas. Look at what's happened in Las Vegas since the shooting itself. The fearful events of that night has led in my hometown where I've lived my entire life except for four weird years in Florida where it's very damp. <laughs> These fearful events of that night have led to a city coming together like never before. I spoke with a man that's lived in Las Vegas. He comes to the second service. He's, lived, he's, a, he's a vet, he's a hero, he's an amazing man if you ever hear a story. He told me this, he says, ah, I've lived here for, I forget what is it, eight, 10 years, something like that. And he said, I've always looked at, this is what he said, I've always looked at Vegas as the place I'm going to be for a while till I move. And he said, you know what, pastor? He says, it's crazy. He said, on that Monday, I realized this is my home. This is my city. You know, isn't it interesting what God does with someone as he brings them through a tragic event? Doesn't it change them? 
Isn't it amazing that perhaps what God is doing with this city is that as we've gone through a tragic event, he's even changing our city. I never thought, I never, I never thought I would see a day as you drive down Las Vegas Boulevard to see the casino sign saying things like, pray for Vegas. (laughs) Can I get an amen? Amen. (laughs) I've never seen this city the way I've seen this city in the last few weeks. I'm shocked by what God is doing here. You say, isn't it amazing? Yes, but don't forget, you can't get there to the rainbow until you go through the storm. I see that trauma leads to triumph, that fear gives way to fresh faith, that God is transitioning this city into another level. Look, the same may be true for you. The same was true for Noah. The same was true for the planet during Noah's time. And the same is true right here for your life. And what I'm saying is this, look for the rainbow that you're coming into as you are coming out of the storm. One of the things that I see in the rainbow is a promise that God will judge the wicked, but number two, he will reward the weary. Can I get an amen? Amen. The third promise that I see in the story of Noah, and I love this one, the third one that I see here is that God will end the war. Say, what war are you talking about, Pastor Josh? Well, very simple. The answer is the war between God and man. See, I didn't even know we were at war. Well, let's explain. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, again says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. What many people miss in the story of Noah is this, that the story of Noah is simply one small battle in a larger war that's taking place throughout human history. It is a war between man and God. You say, God is at war with man? No, no, no. God's never been at war with man. But the moment man got placed in this world, we got at war with God. God said, here's a gift. It's called the garden. Man said, we don't want your gift. We'll do what we want to do. Here's a planet. Inhabit it and be fruitful and multiply. Don't tell us what to do. We'll tell you what to do. We're at the point in the war itself where we're declaring that our opponent doesn't even exist. According to the scripture, man has always and continually been at war with God. And then the Bible says in Genesis 9, verse 13, look at the beauty of this. God says, here's my covenant with you. I will set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be that when the cloud is over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. What is he saying? He's saying that when you see the rainbow, it is a sign that I will never destroy the world by flood again. But can I propose to you something very interesting? That I believe that the rainbow set in the cloud not only signifies that the world will never be destroyed by flood again, by water again. I believe that his setting of the bow in the cloud signifies something else about the larger war between man and God. And that is this. There is coming a day where the war itself between man and God will cease because God will send someone who will cease that war through his own sacrifice. Do you understand the symbol significance of someone setting a bow aside. Throughout history, something has been very, very uh, clear in almost every culture. When dad comes home from war, he takes his weapon and he hangs it over the fireplace. And when we see that weapon hung over the fireplace, the family knows one thing. Everything is okay. But when we see that dad runs for that musket or runs for that sword or runs for that bow, then we need to be careful because the war is on. And when God says, I've set my bow in the clouds, I believe it's significant and symbolizes this, that the war between God and man is coming to a close, that soon one day I will send someone who will allow me to put my bow up and I will never harm humanity again. Why? Because God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him 
him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When I look up into the sky and I see the rainbow there, it reminds me that the weapons of God's warfare are going away because God is in the process of winning mankind back to himself. Oh, friend, why would you remain at war with God who wants to be at peace with you? Why would you want to fight against a God who not only could utterly and in any moment crush you, but by his grace and his mercy preserves you and brings you to a point of salvation so he can save you. And he hangs his bow in the cloud to show that he loves you. And he says to you, come to me. Why would you stay at war with that God? Oh, I love the beautiful truth that though, though, though we are at war with God to this day, God is not at war with us. After the hurricane, I wish I could tell you, because it would make a great story, that I walked outside and there was a rainbow. I didn't. Instead, late that night, late, late that night, the couple I was staying with came home I was sitting on the couch. That's not true. I was kneeling beside the couch. <laughs> God, I will give you my life, <laughs> you know. They asked me, how you doing, Josh? I lied, I'm fine. You know, when you're talking to an 18-year-old boy, he's cool, it's cool, it's fine. I was freaking out, man. I do remember distinctly, his name was Paul, he came up. And he put his hand on my shoulder. He said, you know, everything's going to be okay. I heard on the news that the storm is coming to an end. It's passing. Look, what I'm trying to do to you today is say this. Everything's going to be okay. The storm is passing. The rainbow is coming. And when you see that rainbow, remember what it signifies. Yes, God will judge the wicked. He will give grace to the weary. Oh, and the war is ending. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a beautiful truth you've given us in your word today. And my prayer for every man, woman, and child, every teenager in this room, that as we've studied the word of God today, you would bring us to a point of decision, that you would not only allow us to see truth, but that we would decide to follow you based on the truth that we've seen. In the name of Jesus Christ, your son, we pray. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connect at southernhills.church. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhills.church slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach people around the world. 